Thank you all for joining us tonight, this lovely evening. Um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share Monitoring the Future, which is near and dear to my heart, as you might imagine. I have a chat function here I can see, and I'm more than happy to take questions during my presentation. I know this stuff really well. Sometimes I might cross over something that I know and understand that you've never been exposed to before. So please feel free to uh, interject and ask for clarification or any other kinds of questions you might have. So the title of my talk today is Tracking U.S. Drug Use with Long Term Future. How U.S. Adolescent Drug Use Has Changed During the Pandemic and How to Access the Data for Your Research. And so the general idea behind this presentation today is the first part where I speak, I'm hoping to whet your appetite for what can be done with monitoring the future with one substantive example. Uh, as it turns out, uh, we publish from Monitoring the Future about 50 to 100 articles every year. So I can't really cover everything in one talk. I thought it'd be better to focus in on a specific example. And then after I talk, as uh, Dr. Kaga said, uh, Deb, is then going to go into detail and explain how you can access the data for your own research. So we have a website through NADA, and uh, there's two versions of the data, which Deb will talk about more. There's a, there's a public version available to anyone, and there's no weights though. So the estimates might be a little bit off from what you'd get using the weights. And it's difficult to, to calculate standard errors, but um, there's another version which has all the weights. And basically, it's all the data that we have. And if you apply and get IRB approval, then you can work with them and analyze anything you want with MTF. So the substantive example I want to talk about today is drug use during the pandemic, specifically adolescent drug use. And as it turns out, there were huge declines in substance use from 2020 to 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are the largest declines for lifetime past year and past month use of cannabis, also known as marijuana, alcohol, and date nicotine. So the question I'm gonna ask is, are these decreases in initiation, uh, let me rephrase that, is it the fact that fewer kids started using drug use that are the main driver of declines in past 12 month use and past 30 day use? So it could be the answer is yes. The 2021 declines in past year and past month use stem primarily from adolescents who in other years would have initiated in 2021. Or the answer could be no. The answer could be the declines in past year and past month use are really more than the absence of new initiatives. It could be that people who have experienced using drugs before the pandemic, adolescents, maybe they stopped using. So it's not just the fact that people never started, it's people who had started earlier, maybe they stopped during the pandemic as well, and that accounts for the declines in the past 12 months and past 30 days. Hope that's clear. If not, you know, please feel free to put a question in the chat. So the introduction, here, I'm going to go off script a little bit and just tell you a little bit about MTF, and Deb Klauska will tell you more. But MTF started in 1975 with a nationally representative survey of 12th graders. And it surveyed about 15,000 of them. And it's continued with that survey every year with no interruption all the way to the current day, to 2021, which I'm going to use in this, in this presentation. And in 2022, which is data that's just come in and we're analyzing right now as I speak. So um, in 1991, the project added nationally representative surveys of eighth graders and 10th graders. So since 1991, we've had surveys of about 41,000 adolescents when there's not a pandemic. I'll get into it more of it during the pandemic, our, our numbers went down. But for the most part, we have about 41,000 surveys of adolescents in every year since 1991. 
Uh, and there's another component to it, which I won't get into in my talk today, but starting in 1976, of those 15,000 12th graders, the investigators at that time took a random sample of 2,500 of them and enrolled them in a panel study. So they started following them forward. And then in 1977, they did the same thing. They took the 2,500 and they started giving them surveys later into their lives while still continuing the survey of the 1976 12th grade cohort. In 1978, they did the same, you get the idea. So right now, MTF has 46 or so active longitudinal panels, all of which started with baseline respondents in the 12th grade and all of which were followed forward. So um, that's really a remarkable data source. I don't know anything else like it. If you want to look at developmental, um, processes, for example, you could you could look at those, but you could look at them in historical context. So you could see, well, maybe something predicted your outcome in the future years in 1978, but today that doesn't hold anymore because the historical context has changed. So um, I say, and people think I'm exaggerating, but but it really is true that I think MTF is the best drug study in the history of the world. I really do. I, I don't think there's anything else like it out there. And we have questions other than drugs too. We, we cover all the major drugs, we cover about 70 drugs. Uh, but then we have questions about attitudes, uh, youth attitudes and opinions too. And the, uh, the surveys of the older adults are up to age 60 now. Um, those cover more age appropriate content, content as well. So anyway, that was just um, a little digression there. I'm going to focus specifically on the years, um, well, I'm going to focus on the year 2021 when the pandemic hit and the effects of that on MS and drug use. So um, the record declines in US adolescent substance use during COVID are not surprising, given, given the social distancing policies that were explicitly designed to limit interactions among adolescents. So, as we all know, these include many school buildings were closed. And if you think about it, it's hard to think of any risk factor greater for drug use than going to school. Because when you go to school, you have peer pressure there, you have a source for drugs, basically. You might be invited to parties with your peers where drugs are gonna be used. And so the kids who were staying at home all day didn't go to school. Well, they were not exposed to those risk factors for drug use that they normally would have been exposed to. There also were reductions and cancellations of after school group activities, so sports teams, for example, more opportunities for peers to interact, oftentimes without parental supervision. And that is uh, a time ripe for teen substance use. And the physical distancing policies required everybody to stay six feet apart for those who complied, including teens. So that would really put a damper on, you know, smoking marijuana with your friends or drinking alcohol with your friends if you feel that by doing so, you might put yourself at risk for COVID. So um, what are the consequences of these policies for COVID in terms of drug use? As I mentioned, they reduced exposure to peer pressure to use drugs. They reduced access to drugs through friends and, 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 and the parents or teen, older brothers and sisters of their friends. And uh, there were fewer opportunities to use drugs free from parental supervision. There were no parties, you know, after school. There were no, um, there was no problem. <laughs> so, um, I'm not, in this paper, going to try to explain it specifically what it was that led to the decrease in drug use, but I just want to put this out there as an explanatory context. And given all of these considerations, it's really not that surprising that there were big drops in drug use. I, I think many of us in the field, we, we expected that there would be a big drop in drug use. So um, in 2021, there were record declines in lifetime use. And lifetime, mean, a lifetime use means, have you ever used marijuana in your life? Or have you ever used alcohol in your life? Or 
have you ever used um, a vaping device in your life? And so you can see cannabis there. I start from 1992, and this is for eighth, 10th, and 12th grade combined. And what you see, you can see in from year to year. So I don't have 1991 because that's the baseline year for this graph. But from 1991 to 1992, there was a, about a 2% absolute decline in drug use. And then from 1992 to 1993, there was about, you know, maybe another 2% increase. And so there's um, these lines above this black line are increases and these lines below are decreases. And when you come to 2021, wow, we've never seen anything like that. I mean, that is a huge decline in the context of our survey. So that's cannabis. We'll look at the same thing for alcohol. Um, so there was a survey text, the uh, survey question text change in 1993. So we can't really compare the 1992 and 1991 directly. Uh, so I start here with 1994 and see there's a slight decrease from 1994 uh, in comparison to the previous year, which is 1993. And there really, there's been a lot of decreases actually, both alcohol and adolescent cigarette smoking. Um, since the late 1990s, they've really declined so considerably. Uh, there was beginning to be a slight increase around 2020. And then in 2021, this huge decrease. And I should say here, by the way, I should clarify in 2020, we were doing our surveys as we do every year. And so we usually started around February. And then the University of Michigan on March 15th, 2020, stopped all human subjects research, or at least most of it. Anything that wasn't clinical, that wasn't you know, directly uh, saving or helping people's health. And so our 2020 numbers are entirely pre-pandemic. This is the data. These are the results we got before we were shut down before the pandemic and the social distancing policies all took place. So this is almost, you know, peer pandemic. Um, and then here we have 2021, um, where we, uh, the kids, many of them were in school or not in school, they were at home, so they at home. And so we, um, we administered the survey over the web uh, to those kids. Finally, to continue with this, nicotine vaping, which we first started asking about in 2017. Uh, and this is also known as e-cigarettes. And what we find is that, uh, well, from 2017 to 2018, this is interesting, this was the largest increase in any substance uh, that we've ever measured in monetary future for the past, for the previous 45 years. So this adolescent vaping, it just really took off. And then it too, from 2018 to 2019, it, Again, it took off even more. And then it starts to plateau and only increase a little bit in 2020. And then 2021, boom. Again, one of these huge decreases in lifetime use. So these are kids, they have never, there's more and more kids in 2021 who had never vaped nicotine, never drank alcohol, and never smoked marijuana or used it in any other form, such as you know, vaping. So the size of these lifetime declines was about seven percentage points. That's an absolute change. You know, it was seven percentage points lower in 2021 than it was in 2020. Um, and in relative terms, for each of these substances, they declined by about 20% in just one year, which again is unheard of. We've never seen anything like that. And so the interpretation of this decline is that. They result the declines from adolescents who did not initiate use in 2021. And they would have been expected to have done so if social and policy circumstances had been the same as they were in 2020. So if everything had been the same, we wouldn't have seen these declines. And these kids would have initiated use uh, like they had in previous years. So something about the pandemic, the social citizen policies probably led to this big decline. And so we have more more adolescents now who have never used these drugs um, that we've had in a long time. So the specific research question I'm asking is kind of a methodological kind of a technical one, is what are the consequences of this lowered drug initiation 
for the decline in the past 30 days, past 12 month use, because those all go decline. And every year that we survey adolescents, a portion of them who report that they use in the past 30 days or the past 12 months, a portion of them every year had just started in the past 30 days or the past 12 months. They were new initiatives, right? So um, it's possible that all those declines in past 30 and past 12 months use, um, it's possible that they result entirely from adolescents who did not initiate that year from what happened previously. So they would have initiated the past 30 days or the past 12 months. And they had it. And so that's why past 30 days and past 12 months years went down. It's also, of course, possible that the record of clients past 30 days and past 12 months use, they're independent of the client's initiation. So perhaps uh, some kids initiated many years earlier and they stopped too. And so it's not so much that it's this initiation change that led to decreases in past 30 and past 12 month use. It's just, um, it, it would have happened even if there hadn't been these two clients in lifetime use. So all that being said, I, I, I preface this a little bit, I tease a little bit. There's an important caution here. MTF, we changed our survey mode in 2021. So pretty much all national school-based surveys, and there's only a couple of them. There's Monitoring the Future. There's the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which is also school-based. Uh, there's also the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System for adolescents, which is also school-based. They all changed to a web-based questionnaire in 2021 because we all realized there's gonna be a lot of kids who are going to be schooling at home during the pandemic. And if we want to do our survey, we're gonna to have to be able to reach them somehow. So in terms of NTF, in 2020, we serendipitously had just switched from paper and pencil surveys to electronic tablets. So we brought electronic tablets to the schools and those electronic tablets were hooked up to the internet. And so the difference in survey mode from 2020 to 21, <coughs> it's, 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 not, it's, it's less dramatic than it would have been otherwise, because in the previous year, we had already done the survey electronically. And so now we just did it using school computers or the kids use their own computers. And it's important to note also that in 2020, the, um, the tablets were connected to the internet. So, so in both years, 2020 and 2021, the kids knew that their answers were connected to the internet. Uh, it's particularly interesting to consider uh, what happens for the kids who were taking the survey at home. How did the mode effect affect them, which we'll talk about. Uh, and specifically, it's possible that what we have here is what I call an over the shoulder effect, right? So it could be that uh, in school, the kids were uh, free to answer however they felt because they knew how to hunch over the desks and spread other people from seeing what they were doing. But maybe the kids who were schooling at home taking the survey, maybe they were afraid their parents might see or their siblings might see their answers. And so they didn't answer truthfully. Maybe if they had used drugs, maybe they reported they hadn't because they were taking the survey at home. So that's something we're going to consider in the report. Okay, so data for monitoring the future. Um, as I mentioned, it's an ongoing series of surveys on American adolescents, college students, and adults since 1975. It's conducted here at ISR. It's funded by the U.S. National Institute on Drug Use, or NIDA for short. And it's under, it's under competitive research grants uh, uh, umbrella. So we get reviewed every five years and hope for the best that will be refunded for an additional five years. So, to address these goals, what we need are representative data. We want to know what drug use was for the nation as a whole. Uh, and ideally, we want a sample of all US adolescents. Ideally, we want a random draw so that we can generalize from our sample to the population as a whole. Uh, and the way I think of this is you can imagine you have a paint can full of unknown liquids, some of it is oil, some of it is water, some of it is gasoline, for example. And you wanna know what proportion of each of those substances is in your liquid. So what you can do is you could, you could take that paint can 
and you could shake it real vigorously. I don't know if you've been a hardware store, they have these things that really shake these things like you can't believe. And I wanted a picture of that, but I could find. This is the best I could find. Um, but if you mix it really well like that, then if you take a teaspoon out right after you mix it, then the proportions of that teaspoon, like say 20% is gas and 30% is oil, and the rest is, um, what did I say? Oh, the rest is the other one. Um, then the proportions in that teaspoon will be plus or minus, you know, a couple of a percentage point or so, the same proportions as in the whole um, paint can as, as a whole. So um, the results that we get by surveying maybe 40 to 50,000 adolescents every year are, we feel quite confident that they're pretty much the same given a percentage point or two compared to if we survey all 12 million US 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in the US, which is what our in-school service focused on, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade. So uh, just to give you an idea here, we're not the only one that does this. Um, you might hear in, uh, in the newspaper or on TV that the unemployment rate has gone up or something, and that 40% um, of the unemployed are looking for work. And you might ask yourself, well, how do they know that? Nobody asks me. Well, the US government relies on a sample of the case of 60,000 people that they survey. And then they generalize from that to the United States as a whole. The Consumer Confidence Index, there's a, a whole list of these type of measures where you take just a sample, a well-defined random sample uh, of the US, uh, and then you generalize uh, as a whole. Deb, you just materialized. Do you, you want to tell yes. me something or you just want to? Yes, yeah. we have a question, and this is the perfect time for the question okay. from Michelle. She says, could you provide a little mo bit more of the information about what measures this survey has taken to ensure participants are giving honest answers to these sensitive type of questions? Yes, that's an excellent question. So it turns out adolescents are not shy. So um, in some years, we've had 80% of our adolescents report that they've used an illegal drug at some point in their lives. So they don't seem to mind telling us uh, those, those answers. Um, also, we also look at what we call construct validity. So we have measures of questions like, do you think it's dangerous to smoke marijuana regularly? And what we find is there's a very strong correspondence between those answers and in terms of perceived risk and whether they're actually using the drug or not. Uh, also, we also ask them, do you think you're, or, or not do you think, but do you know, do your friends use drugs? And really, there's no incentive for them to lie about that because it's not about them. We don't ask them who their friends are. We just ask them, well, you know, are your friends using drugs? And we know from the literature that if your friends are using drugs, you are much more likely to use drugs. And sure enough, there's a very strong correspondence in our data. So in terms of construct validity, there's, um, there's a, a strong reason to believe that the answers are, are, are consistent with what we would expect if we're getting honest answers. All that being said, um, if you'd like, you can, you can email me afterwards. Uh, we have a document where we actually list eight reasons why we think that these uh, answers are honest. So uh, yeah, uh, and I'll say one more thing about that too. Um, uh, we do clean the data, so Every now and then we get what we call technically, the technical term is jokers and clowns. At least that's what we call them. Uh, people who aren't really answering seriously. And you can tell, right, kids who say um, that they use heroin, cocaine, and marijuana every day. And they've done so their whole lives. And so we throw those out. We have quality control. And that tends to be about 3% uh, of the sample. Um, so there's that. Also, what we find in and you'll see this a little bit more uh, later in the talk, is that our results are remarkably consistent from year to year. So to the extent that maybe there's um, um, some bias in our results, and maybe there's a, a small percentage that aren't reporting drug use, even though they are using drugs. Well, we can expect from year to year that we're probably pretty much the same. So if we make that assumption, then when we focus on change over time, 
then any bias that was present in both years cancels out, right? So what we're looking at is just the change. And that's part of the reason my research question here focuses on the big drop from 2020 to 2021, um, because I, I want to focus on that change rather than the specific prevalence in a particular year. So I hope that answers the question, but uh, feel free to follow up with me. Okay, so um, monitoring the future, one of its um, big value added aspects, I think, is that we go through this process of uh, generating a random draw of eighth, 10th, and 12th grade students. And we do it separately. We don't go to school and ask to survey their eighth, 10th, and 12th graders. We have a list of all the schools in the US that have eighth grade students. And we, we survey, we, we select those schools, uh, we, we select a sample of those schools, and then we just survey the eighth graders. And then we do the same thing for 10th graders. We have a list of all the 10th grade schools in the United States, or schools that have 10th graders. And we just, you know, um, we just focus on that. And so no school ever has two grades sampled at the same time. So in a way, our eighth, 10th, and 12th grade samples are kind of like three separate random samples. And when we find a strong pattern that replicates across all three uh, grades, we have much more confidence in it because it's like we did the same study three times uh, independently. So we have a sample, we have a target sample list of all public and private schools in the US. You can't actually get that from the US government. The US government keeps track of public schools, but they don't really keep track, or at least they don't publish statistics on private schools per se, in terms of you know, the enrollment and the stuff that we need. So we have, a, we have a private vendor that we buy this information from, and this private vendor is commercial, they're mostly focused on um, selling textbooks to schools and to teachers, uh, but we use your information for our purposes. And we have a professional sampling statistician who works with us full time to make sure that the sample is drawn correctly. And we survey in non-pandemic years about 40,000 students total and about 410 public and private secondary schools every year. Um, as of 2021, we have surveyed more than 1.5 million adolescents. And this is a pet peeve of mine. And if you get nothing else from this talk today, I, I hope you remember this. Um, the, the big thing, the reason the monitoring the future data is valuable is because it's representative. It's because we go through all this work with our professional sampling statistician. And so because of that, we are able to generalize to the US adolescent population as a whole. Our value is not in our large sample size. And the reason this gets to me is that every now and then you'll see in the media, somebody will, will talk about a survey and they'll say, and they surveyed 30,000 people as if somehow that is a quality that's fantastic in and of itself. But you know, it's not because if you, if you survey 30 people that you just found on the street, um, you know, going to work or whatever, then that's a sample of convenience and you can't really generalize to anything with a survey like that. So um, the value added of MCF is the fact that we are able to scientifically say, we have scientific reason, justification to say that our results are generalizable to the population as a whole. And we do have a large sample, but that's not because we're trying to impress people. That's because we oftentimes zero down and focus in on specific demographic subgroups, like African-Americans or people in rural areas or people with, uh, whose parents have low education. And so uh, our interest in those groups requires a large sample size and so that we have enough sample to really zero in on them and, and, and to make you know, uh, uh, generalizations that do analyses that don't have huge standard errors. Okay. So uh, in 2020, that was the year the pandemic shut us down, March 15th. We collected about 10,000 total surveys among eight, 10, and 12th graders before the university shut us down. Um, and then in 2021, we were able to do a full centrics for a survey from February to June. And we collected about uh, 30,000 surveys uh, with that, which is a little less than our equal 40,000. But as you can imagine, the schools were swamped. A lot of them were figuring out, do they want to be hybrid? Or do they want to be fully remote? Or do they want to be in person? And they didn't have a lot of time to do a survey like ours, but fortunately, uh, we employ four, four full-time callers. Their job is to recruit schools, you know, based on 
the random sample that we did, and they did a fantastic job. Okay, so that's the background for the data. Total sample sizes, just so you know what we're talking about. Cannabis, we have 31 years of data from 1991 to 2021. We have 1.3 million respondents. For alcohol, we have 1.2 million respondents. Again, we have about 29 years. And for nicotine vaping, which is a newer phenomenon, we have five years of data and we have about 81,000 respondents. Results. Okay, so in 2021, we saw the largest prevalence decline to record for all three drugs for all three reporting events for lifetime, past 12 months, and past 30 day use. So I showed these to you earlier. This, this is lifetime prevalence. You see those huge declines. <coughs> and for 12 month prevalence, um, for cannabis, as you can see, remember these are changes from year to year. And so way back in the 1990s, cannabis use was increasing. Um, but then, you know, we see this huge decrease in 2021. Uh, uh, for past 12 months years. We see that for alcohol, we also see that for nicotine vaping. And um, for 30 day use, we also see these very large declines, larger than anything we've ever seen before uh, in, in 30 years. So, go to the next slide. Oh, yes. So, if I were to take just these red bars here and give you information just on them. I'll do that in my next slide. And so you see that lifetime cannabis use, uh, it went down 7% from 2020 to 2021. And here's the 2021 prevalence, here's the 2020 prevalence. So it fell from 30% to 23%, which is 7.1% decline. Um, and then you know, for 12 months, it fell about 7%. For 30 days, it fell about 4%. So just again, so this, um, this is 7%, this is 6.7%, this is and this is 3.6%. This is so I'm just giving you the, the detailed numbers for these declines that you see here. And the important thing is that all these declines from 2021 are the largest one year declines we've ever seen in the history of monitoring the future. And they're all statistically significant. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you the same results, but I'm going to restrict the analysis pool to students who are attending all of the classes in the school building. Because as you recall, I was worried about this shift in survey mode to the web. And some people who are taking the survey at home, they might've been victim of this over the shoulder effect that I was talking about. So maybe, maybe all these declines are driven by the fact that we had some kids who were three at home. And, um, and one way to try to get at that is I'm gonna restrict the sample to only the kids who were taking the survey in school on school grounds, which is what we did for every other year for all 47 other years of all computers. So it's directly comparable to what we did in the past and about 50% of the kids were taking the survey in school when they took it in 2020. And that's because the survey went from February to June. So in later months, more schools had reopened and this is nationally representative. So, you know, there's some schools in some states that didn't think COVID was that big a deal. And, you know, like, well, we all know that. Um, and so they continued to hold their classes to school like they always have. So when I restrict the analysis to in-school surveys, what we see again are these huge declines. And every single one of these declines is the largest we've ever seen in the history of MTF. So I draw from this, um, this supplementary analysis. The conclusion I draw is that these declines, you can't just attribute them to, oh, you have a different survey mode. They're real. The substantive, and you know, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, during the pandemic, uh, it was not a lot harder to use drugs without your parents knowing. So, I'm going to move on then, and then I'm going to get into my fancy analysis. And so, what I have here in model one for cannabis, uh, I have past 12 months use, and I'm uh, comparing the year 2021 to these reference period years, so 216 to 2020, I have all the years uh, from 1992 forward in, in my analysis. Uh, and so 
Again, I'm focusing on changes from year to year. And um, I also include, sorry about my slide work here. I need to work on it. Ah, what is going on? Um, and, uh, Boy, I don't know, you saw my conclusions. You don't need to listen to me anymore. Um, oh, yeah, that's... The slide has disappeared from my screen. Oh. Do you want to go out of sharing and come back in to screen share? I do. I could still see the slides. I'm going to share again right now. Okay, so you can all see that, I hope. Perfect. Okay, yep. You can see it, Deb. So here what I'm modeling is the change in cannabis, cannabis use from for 2021 compared to the previous years. And I control for prevalence for past 12 months cannabis use in the previous year. So I'm really focusing on change when, when I have that coefficient in the model. And the general idea here is that for cannabis, we go back to 1994. And for every year, we know how much of a change there was in lifetime prevalence of cannabis use. But we also know how much of a change there was in past 12 month cannabis use and past 30 day cannabis use. So there's kind of an association there. And so we're using all the information, all the data we have from 1991 forward. But look at that association, basically uh, between lifetime changes in use and past 12 month and past 30 day changes in use. And so what I do in column two is I include change in lifetime prevalence in cannabis use since the last year. And once I include that in my model, then this coefficient, which was significant, highly statistically significant, it's no longer significant. And so the interpretation of that is, after you control for the changes in lifetime prevalence of cannabis, that accounts for, it attenuates any change there was in past 12 month years. Or another way you can try to think about that is that um, that, that decrease in 12, in 12 month years is according to this model, it's largely because in previous years, we would have had people who newly initiated uh, in that year. And without those people, after you take that into account, there really is no change in past 12 month use of cannabis use. Hope that makes sense, but feel free to follow up with me afterwards if you have questions. And then, um, let's see. Oh, yes, I got confused. So uh, I'm going to go on to nicotine vaping. I don't have as many years as I have for cannabis use, but you see the same general pattern. What you see is that in 2021, as compared to the reference years, there was a, a very large statistically significant decline in past 12 month substance use of nicotine vaping. Um, but once you put in the model, the big change in lifetime prevalence, uh, what you see is that that change in past 12 month nicotine vaping is no longer statistically significant. Or in other words, it's the change in lifetime use of nicotine vaping that accounts for the change in 12 month use. And you see the same thing with alcohol. So with alcohol, there is a big change in 12 month use. Um, but once you take into account the fact that there was a big change in lifetime prevalence, or in other words, there was a lot less initiation of alcohol use, it accounts for the 12 month substance use change. So um, I do the same thing, I don't present it here, but I do the same thing with past 30 day use and I get the exact same results. They're all highly significant, the changes from 2020 to 2021. Um, but once you take into account the change in lifetime use or the uh, lower levels of initiation, then uh, it all goes away. The, the significant 30 day use. So all this is to say the way that the pandemic has affected 
at less of substance use is that it has it has led many of them to never initiate. And that accounts for pretty much all the changes we've seen. So um, I'll get to my conclusions then. Uh, decreased initiation drove all the declines in analysis of cannabis alcohol nicotine making in 2021. After taking into account the big declines in initiation, the 2021 declines in past 12 month and past 30 day use of alcohol, nicotine, vaping, and cannabis did not differ from previous years. So I take this to mean that year 2021 was a grand national experiment in delayed onset of adolescent drug use. And you know, there's a lot of literature out there on delaying drug use. For example, with um, cigarette smoking or marijuana use, the idea is that if you can, in adolescence, delay by one year any adolescent from using any of these drugs, well, then they're less likely to use that drug for the rest of their lives. And that's because there are no changes, associated changes in the brain that might prime the adolescent brain for future drug use. There's also um, uh, less chance that they'll become known as a drug user and less chance that they'll develop friendships specifically with people who also use drugs in the same way that they do. So um, this 20, 20 year allows, in terms of research and new ideas, uh, an unprecedented opportunity to look at the social factors that predict delayed adolescent onset of drug use. <coughs> so I didn't get into it here, but you know, there's a real paper that's written out there. Which of those those many social distancing policies are responsible for the light drug use that we see here uh, for kids not initiating drug use? Is it um, that they didn't hang out with their peers? Is it that um, there was more parental supervision? Is it that they were less likely to parties? I mean, it's the perfect paper, right? You could, you could list four or five different reasons and then do the analysis and see which one wins. And you, know, you wouldn't be, uh, You'd be very objective because you can make a story out of it. It would be important and interesting no matter how it's been done. That's the best kind of research question in my opinion. So um, in the future also, year 2020 and the MTF data allows a, a real unprecedented opportunity to look at the consequences of the way that we'll be able to see in these coming years, these kids who in 2020 didn't use drugs, we have that panel study, as you recall, uh, we'll be able to see if they continue to have lower levels of drug use than the, than the cohorts that came before them and after them. And it could be that maybe these adolescents maybe will catch up in their drug use behaviors. Maybe in 2020, they weren't able to use drugs like they would have in previous years, and they're going to make up for it uh, going forward. Or maybe uh, it'll result in a lifetime reduction in drug use. That's you know a great question with all kinds of policy implications. Uh, that being said, I also want to point out that adolescent drug use was actually quite robust in 2021. I mean, if you think about it, so it declined about well here I say one quarter, but maybe one fifth. It declined about 20 percent in just one year, but it did not decline to zero. You know, um, the population controls on adolescent interactions were perhaps the strictest they've ever been in decades. You know, the six, the six feet rule and, and um, people staying at home and not going to school. And despite all this, Alice and drug use, 80% of it is still continued. Uh, I think it's difficult to imagine stricter controls. I think it's difficult to imagine a president saying, I'm gonna reduce Alice and drug use and I'm gonna, I'm gonna require everyone to stay at home. You can only go outside for essential needs. Uh, and even if someone did that, we would still see that there'd be a lot of problems among adolescents. So it's possible, and I'm going out on a limb here, but um, it's 2020, I wrote 2021, which should be 2020. Is it like a theoretical maximum for short term policies? Saying, I'm sorry, it is 2021. Uh, is it like a maximum for this is the most we could ever expect adolescent drug use to decline in one year, 20%? That was an extraordinary circumstance. You know, never, we'll never see that again. Um, that's the most we'll ever see. I, I think it's, I think it's possible that that's it. This is the limit. 
for one year. Um, so my overall conclusions are um, reduced initiation was the driving force for 2020-21 decreases in analysis use of cannabis, alcohol, and nicotine. Um, there's an unprecedented opportunity here to look at the predictors and consequences of the late onset. And I'll leave it at that. And now I'm happy to turn the screen over to Deb Kloska, who is going to talk about how you can access this data for your own research if that's what you want to do. And um, Dr. Traugott mentioned that Deb has been with the project for 25 years. And she is really a treasure. Uh, she knows this data inside and out. And, and if you're interested, you know, you can work with her and she'll help you to figure out how to get the data. And it's really a great opportunity because there's few people in the world who know the data better than she does. And with that, I will stop my share and hand it over to Deb. Thank you. There is one more question for you, Richard. Oh, Did you okay. see any changes in drug use patterns due to COVID in the longitudinal data. Um, to my no, well, the 2021 panel data are just now coming to us. Um, so I don't know that anybody's looked at that even preliminarily yet. Do you, Richard? Same because same. the way the panel data get collected, um, it's from April to October. And then it takes us anywhere from three to six months to manage that data to get it into a usable form. So it's actually a question for you, Deb. So yeah, because um, we, it's, we'll find out. We don't know. Stay tuned. OK, great. Well, thank you. And, and, and I'll just interject. I'm sorry, I'll just interject. You could use the data uh, that's coming in the future, and you could build a question about that yourself if you wanted to and find out. Perfect. Okay, let me share my screen. So welcome, and now that Richard's shown you the kinds of things that are there, I'm going to show you how and where to access the data. We have the MTF data are available to researchers through the National Addiction and HIV Data Archive Program, which is part of ICPSR. Our public use data are available for the annual cross-sectional data through 2020. So since 1976 for the 12th grade, when we start collecting data on the 12th graders. And then since 1991, when we start collecting data on the 8th and 10th graders. The new data are released each year in November for the prior year. So for example, the 2021 data Richard was talking about will be available publicly in November of 2022. We now have restricted use data, which are available for the annual cross-sectional variables that are truncated or omitted from the public use files. And Richard sort of mentioned um, the altered weight variable for the sample. And there are other variables that are truncated or omitted from the files to, for confidentiality reasons. And we'll talk more about what those are in a moment. And as of March of 2022, we now have our longitudinal panel sample data in the restricted NADAP archive as well. This looks at ages 19 to 30 and then 35 to 60. For the public use data, Here's the website link, and I know you'll all be getting the slides to go with this, so this you can check that, but I will go there in a moment. The public use data are a great starting point for your work. That is where you'll find the documentation on the MTF study through the years. We've been putting data there since 1976, as Richard mentioned. And for the 12th graders, there are five or six forms of the data, depending on the year. For the 8th and 10th graders, there are four forms of the data. There's a core data set for the 12th grade that includes all of the drug use variables and the demographic variables. That's what people are most interested in to start usually. And then they'll add in psychosocial variables like self-esteem or um, fatalism or depressive affect or things like that. And those are only on specific forms. 
The analyst can download the data and work independently with their software of choice. You can explore the documentation that's there. The downloads include the data themselves in various forms, SAS, STATA, SPSS, text file, um, with instructions on how to manage, merge, and create your own subset. We have codebooks that are annually updated with information about the study and documentation of the annual questionnaire changes. The documentation expanded its scope in 2018 to include methodology changes and highlight them. The survey changes, um, examples for survey data analysis, and specific details on the variables that are truncated or omitted from the public use files. And uh, as I mentioned, they're truncated for confidentiality reasons. Let's, I'm going to go quickly over to the website. I have the right one. This is the cross-sectional. So this, the link will take you to this website. There's a little bit of an explanation about the MTF. Then you will see that there are 76 entries here. There are files for 8th, 10th, and 12th grade from 1976 forward, as I mentioned. I'm going to take a quick pop over to 2020. So each year will have its own its own entry. There's a 12th grade set. There's an 8th and 10th grade set. They're set up in the same way. They have the same information in general, but of course, particular to their, their surveys. For the 12th grade, there's all kind, for those of you who have never been to the website, there, there's an at a glance tab, which gives you a summary of things. Starting in 2019, we included this highlight section. So for anybody who's been using the data or wants to use it even for a single year, you can see the kinds of things that we think are important for users to know. And if you come up with something you think is important for a user to know, by all means, shoot us an email so that we can get it included. There are other tabs to go through, other drop downs to go through with data collection notes, methodology. In the study design section, there will usually be the ends by each, for each form of the data. There's the core data set, which I mentioned, which generally contains the substance use measures and the demographics that are, con that are asked on all of the forms, put into one form so you don't have to combine those. But then there are, specific, there are different questions on the other forms, um, and this tells you the end for the sample for those particular surveys, the particular forms. And this is 2020, so you see for 12th grade we were only able to survey 3,700 um, out of our about 25% of our normal sample. We talk about the sample and the sampling design and the sampling weights, clustering, and stratum. Then those are in the restricted data, but that was what Richard was mentioning about some um, getting into the restricted data so you can use the appropriate adjustments for your standard errors in your analyses. Analysis information down here does talk about the weight variable that's available on the public use data. It's slightly altered to preserve confidentiality because the weights are assigned at a school level, so it would be easier to determine who is in a school. And if the school is small enough and you know a school is participating that year, you could potentially go in and figure out what the school is, where the school is, who the kids are. So we want to keep our respondent um, information as confidential as, and as possible. Um, we do talk about the special note of because it is a complex sample design, you should be using the stratum and cluster variables and the unaltered weight variable. And we give a link right here to the restricted data. So the, so the public use data, again, are out there for anybody and everybody to download and um, year by year, form by form whatever form that takes for you and your research question. Restricted use data is available through NetApp's virtual data enclave. There is an application process for it, and as Richard mentioned, um, you need to have IRB if you are a 
If you do not yet have a terminal degree, such as a PhD, you will need a sponsor. Um, as of August 15th, I can report that there will be no longer any fees associated with accessing the MTF restricted data, so yay. Thank you, NADAP. Again, it's the same sort of website. Um, so for the data that are omitted or truncated, we do provide the restricted files. There is an application process. The restricted use files are the only place to find the complex sample design variables. Um, key variables in the restricted files include the complex sample design variables, the school level geographic identifiers such as state and county FIPS codes and zip codes, and all the, it should say, the expanded list of race and ethnicity questions that are asked along with household composition variables. And please see the manual, the annual code books for more details on all of the restricted data. Um, in the public use data, for example, for race ethnicity, we do provide a variable that um, indicates black, white, Hispanic, um, and any other of the nine categories that we ask about are put into missing data for confidentiality reasons. Um, let me go to let's go to the restricted. So the restricted page looks very similar. I will, if you are using the geographic identifiers, for example, people who would like to merge policy data or um, usually some sort of policy data or census data or things like that, you can do so at the, at the state zip, the state county and FIPS code level or at the, the zip code level. Again, that's at the school level, so every student within a school will have those same values. So we don't have individual students, but it's, it, the general assumption is that they're all living close enough to the school that the, that is a good proxy for their exposures. Um, when you do use the geographic variables, there is a fact here for that because MTF is drawn to be representative at nothing lower than the census region level. So reporting anything at the state zip code or count the state county or zip code level will not be released from the virtual data enclave. Um, you can do something like group states together for, for pre and post policy and things like that, but you cannot report any information. No information will be allowed out of the enclave that identifies a specific state. And if you have questions about your research questions and whether or not the data are use, as useful as you would like them to be, um, please contact us either through MTF information, which the addresses at the end of this presentation, or through the NADAP site. And we work very closely with our NADAP colleagues to make sure that people aren't disappointed once they get in and work with the data. Again, we can go here and search for 2020. This will have one entry because all of the restricted data are in one place. Again, we have summary, the same sorts of information is here. And here we do talk about the complex sample design variables that are specifically included in the restricted data. The data and documentation tab for this will only have documentation. In the public use, you will also have be able to download data, but this only has documentation. And there's a description here of what is included. We break it out by 8th and 10th grade with and without the geographic identifiers. Not everybody needs the geographic identifiers. A lot of people are only going to want the restricted data to incorporate the complex sample design. Um, I can give you a heads up that um, reviewers know that these data are available now. So if you're analyzing the MTF data, um, it, it may not be a surprise anymore when they come back and say, yeah, but you didn't include the complex sample design. So. Um, so just be aware of that. We've had a few instances of that happening. 
You can preview the information here. They're PDFs. You can download the codebooks, and it will go through what is in the files. There's no variable information here because they're restricted data. Um, to access the restricted data, you need to do a NetApp application. Please come at it. Oh, and it's going to pop me right in because there's usually a login screen that comes up. And if you don't have a login with ICPSR, you will need to create one. Then there's instructions here. There's an applicant. Uh, there's a VDE guide that ICPSR provides to walk you through the process. They outline the process here. And as I said before, you need to have a terminal degree or a sponsor in order to access the restricted data. Start a new project, you'd give it a title, you'd put in your description, fill out the information, and then depending on what year of data or years of data you want, you check all the little boxes here. So in this case, I put in 2020, but I can check any boxes I want from here. You can choose your analysis software, and then they would narrow down the files you get to just the software of choice. Um, and then you would create. And I'm not going to do that and put a dummy request into their system. Um, so that is accessible, again, right from, right from the individual site, access the restricted data. The longitudinal panel data, we put longitudinal in panel because people talk about it in both ways. Um, some people also talk about the base year data, our 8, 10, and 12th grade data, as longitudinal data or panel data or longitudinal trend data. But it's, in a ve it's meant in a very different way. This, this longitudinal panel data are repeated measurements on the same people over time. As Richard mentioned, we sample about 2450 students into the panel every year. Half of those are surveyed at age 19 right after high school. The other half are surveyed at age 20. And then they're surveyed every two years after that up to age 30. At age 35, we again go after as many of the people who we originally sampled into the panel who might have been lost, get as many as we can, and then survey them every five years up to age 60. Our age 65 cohort will start in 2023. Respond on intervals. The longitudinal panel data files are only available as restricted data through the NADAP VDE. So there is nothing you can download in terms of data for this. However, there is extensive documentation which will help you plan any kind of analysis you might want to do. The downloads include a user's guide, and we'll pop over there momentarily, um, a cross-time index, which talks about tells all the variables over time that we've asked. Question and response history document gives every detail about a question that we've asked. Um, what forms it's on, what years it's been asked, if it's asked in the base year, in the follow-ups, 19 to 30, or the adult, the middle adult to adult, 35 to 60, and tells you how to locate them in the data set. The data, the longitudinal panel data files also include the data at age eight, from age 18 for the respondents selected into the panel. So not only do you get have the panel data part, but you also get what we consider their base year, their age 18 data. And that's attached to the file, so you don't have to try and figure out how to merge in anything from the cross-sectional data. Currently, we have two panel data files available, the core, which is, includes the demographics and the substance use questions that are common to all of six forms, and a few other variables that are not necessarily common to all forms, but for example, some vaping questions, 
early vaping questions and an ever drink question that are not on all forms, but we do use in analyses frequently and in our reports, so they're included as well. We do have four, six form specific files because the data for the 12th grade is asked across six forms. We are in the process of getting all of those ready to be posted as well. If there are questions and um, variables you need from those files, we have a process in place for you to request those specifically, and that's detailed in the user's guide. Um, our goal is to have be six, seven, the, these eight files up in NADAP so that you don't have to contact us um, for the non-core variables. But it's a work in progress. We, when these data were Selected. Nobody really understood that they were going to get to be this big, this long, and need to be put out there for, for the world. I think this is the best thing that's happened to monitoring the future because I love the panel data. Um, I believe that's how you tell change over time, especially within, a, um, within people. And you can look at age effects, period effects, cohort effects. Um, the data are incredibly rich. Not much has been published on the age 35 to 60 data because it hasn't been made available. It became available in March. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there on the cross-sectional age 18 data. There's a bit out there on the follow-up data, but there's so much more to be done. And it's not just drug use stuff. It's, we have people looking at civic engagement. We had somebody looking at labor relations. We have people looking at time use. We have people looking at... What else do we have? Um, policy issues, um, just all kinds of things from every discipline you can imagine. Uh, we do run a workshop, which I'm sort of hesitant to mention because we had 65 applicants and could accept 12 last time. Um, we will be offering more workshops going forward on the details of how to work with the data, get around the documentation, um, and a little bit of analysis stuff as well. Um, so we welcome your questions. We welcome your use. We are excited to get these data out there for people to use. Um, I have been working with the data for a very long time. There are a couple others of us on staff who have. And to get these data out to a wider audience has just been a labor of love, we'll say. So thank you for your time. If you have questions, comments, concerns, let us know. At the end here, um, if you're applying for and need assistance with the public or restricted use data available through NADAP or you need information on applying, you can contact NADAP VDE support directly. For additional information regarding the Monitoring the Future study, um, email us at mtfinformation at umich.edu. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Michael. So thank you very much. Well, while we uh, have some time to take uh, other questions from the audience, I'm going to take the liberty of interpreting the question that was in the Q&A and re-asking it. Um, I, uh, this is my, my interpretation of it. I, I think one part of it had to do with uh, a question about the nature of the panel design. So if you interviewed a person who was a 12th grader in the year 2000, how many more interviews would they have given in theory? Okay, well, let me look at my little year grid. And this is, this is a very good question because this is one of the things that is hard for a lot of people to get their head around. In fact, let me see if I can pull this up and then reshare, because I will show you. Where's my year grid? Here we go. Because my, my interpretation of the question that was asked was, if you looked at people who were regular users, did their use decline because of COVID compared to the initiators? But that depends upon this, you know, the structure of the file and how much in, how much information you had from right. each person, right? Right. So can you see this wonderful grid? Yeah. Okay. So your question was about somebody in 
Hang on. As a for instance, a 12th grader yep. in 2000. Yep, let me excuse this pain. So we have a 12th grader in 2000. That's this first column. Okay. And if we're out to 2021, they're not going to be somebody who we've seen out. To, let's see, where, where are they going to end up? 2021. We're not going to see them for a, we won't see their stuff in 2021 because in, they're 18 here through their, up to age 20, they're 2002, 2004. So if we wanted to say, so, so this would be your comparison type of group because they're only out here through 2011. Okay. So these are like, these are the follow-ups. So this would be one survey, two surveys, three, four, five, six surveys past their base year, their age 18. So when you get to the changes where 2021 is happening, you're going to have these cohorts at these different follow-ups. where you can start assessing the difference between what they did for this example, 19 and 21. So this is where this, this year grid comes in because of the way, as Richard said, every year we're bringing in new people and yeah. every year we're still sampling, surveying the older people. So is that helpful? Yeah, I think, I think my interpretation of the question was, mm -hmm. If you take the people who were interviewed in 2021, mm -hmm. but who weren't young, mm -hmm. and in principle, you could construct a measure of their use in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. how many of them dropped off because of COVID? How many, how many of them had use that declined mm -hmm. because of COVID the yeah. same way that, there, that Richard described there wasn't initiation? in 2021. Uh-huh. I if if I go mm -hmm. That to me is the meaning of this question. Did you see any change in drug use patterns due to covid in the longitudinal data? Uh-huh. Right. And, and just and so that's a great question, Dr. Traugott, and I look forward to the paper that you write. No, no, it's not. it's, a Mich <laughs> it's a Michelle's question. It's not my question. And, uh, I'm just making sure <laughs> And, um, but and, and just to reiterate, so the 2021 panel data isn't ready yet, but it will be in the coming months. And then we get, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, these, these people who have a history of use, what did they do during the pandemic as adults? Because for them, they probably were a little more able to use alcohol and marijuana if they wanted to. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. great, fantastic question. Mm -hmm. We'll find out. But but the 2021 data won't be available to researchers outside of MTF for probably another year and a half because of the processing we have to do in order to get it out to NADAP. But that being said, things can be set up, you know, looking at everything beforehand so that you know what kind of measures you want to build, knowing those things are coming. And of course, with the 2021 collection, we did have a whole bunch of questions on COVID. I mean, this is really, uh, this really goes to uh, cohort effects as opposed to generational effects, right? What happened, it or what was the impact of those years? Yeah, that's very, cool. yeah various aspects of the population. Both, both, both cohort effects and aging effects, right? Yes. So maybe mm -hmm. that they aged out of drug use or, or maybe their cohort have particularly high or low levels of drug use. Um, so it'd be a little tricky to disentangle that, but but it can be done. And I suppose that, uh, you know, it would, the, the, uh, the measure of prior use wouldn't have to be dichotomous or restricted. I mean, you right. could have heavy users, casual mm -hmm. users, right? Right. To, yeah. to see whether the impact was mm -hmm. different. Yep. 
And we have a question on, on, which I assume is pertaining to the workshops I mentioned. Are there slides or recordings of the workshop available for people that were not selected? Um, no, at this time, no. Um, we're not sure how to make the recordings available. And the I have to quite honestly say what I listened to of the recordings, mm, I don't think they're that good. Um, I talked a lot. Um, the slides are particular to being able to work with the NetApp VDE and specialized data sets that we prepare for that, so they're not totally relevant. However, we are working on something to help people be able to use, to not have to attend the workshop to be able to navigate the documentation in a more efficient way, especially for the panel data. Um, so those things are in progress and process. Um, the dissemination team itself is relatively new in the last four years, maybe. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but we've got a long way to go. And if anybody knows anybody who is really interested in managing data, please send them my way. We could use some more data managers. Um, we yeah. don't need analysts. We don't need analysts. Um, we need data managers. We've got lots of analysts, and I'd like to get back to analysis eventually. Um, but we are looking for data managers. So, you're muted. You maintain a bibliography of uh, studies that have uh, produced results from the data. I imagine there must be a lot of interest, research interest in uh, drug use adoption, especially you know among mm -hmm. young people. Um, I thought the point that you made about the sample size in relation to uh, various small groups, smaller groups uh, in in the high school population, um, is relevant to a lot of people's interests. What about people who are not in school or people who drop out and therefore who don't get interviewed? Uh, you know, the, the issues about comparisons or analysis of those groups? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, it's really not that big a factor in eighth grade or 10th grade, there's not school dropouts. It, yeah. That's what thinking about in 12th grade, they'll become a little more substantial. And that was a larger problem in the 1970s when about 15% of people who were the age to be a 12th grader had dropped out from school. Uh, dropout has, has um, declined considerably. So now, according to the US Census, it's about 7% of 12th graders have dropped out of high school by 12th grade. So it's a small group. And we actually have an annual report on our website called Volume One. We have an appendix devoted specifically to this topic. And what we do is we look at another data set called NADAP, or I'm sorry, called NESTA, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And that's a household survey. And it's both of adults and adolescents. And because it's a household survey, it captures 12th grade age people who have dropped out of high school. And so we compare our results um, with theirs, and we take into account how would our results change if we had successfully interviewed the 12th grade dropouts. And as you can imagine, since it's a small group, it's 7%. Even if this group had levels of drug use twice as high, or even three times as high as non-dropouts, because it's only 7% of the sample, the overall effect isn't very large. It increases the prevalence, including them, would increase the prevalence by you know two or three percent. We we have the exact numbers uh, in the appendix in, in volume one. Um, but and that being said, you know, surprisingly, according to the NOSTA anyway, so the data set that we've used, the uh, drug rates aren't that much higher for school dropouts. Uh, the one exception is cigarette smoking and tobacco use. That is substantially higher um, among the dropouts. But the other drugs, not so much. So we do take that into account. Um, and also, just uh, this is a good opportunity to say again that uh, when we look at trends over time, in 12th grade, for example, when we're comparing one year to the next, there were dropouts in both years. So that difference is not due um, to the dropouts. Yeah, 
Well, we have we have uh, <clears throat> some time for additional questions from the audience if the audience members have them. Uh, otherwise, uh, both uh, Richard and Deb have um, provided contact information. If you have uh, questions that come up as you think more about the data and the possibilities of analysis, you you should feel free to uh, contact them. So I want to thank you very much for a very interesting and thorough presentation about uh, a very large uh, data set research project undertaking that's got a lot of analytical uh, potential for on a variety of topics and a variety of analytical approaches. Um, and uh, we, we wish you, we thank you for coming this evening and we wish you continued success with your data collection efforts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, it's a great thank opportunity. You. Yes, thank you for having us.